Yeah. That's Nathan, cool. when nine eleven happened, what was your perspective on uh, your potential logistical support, uh, the Australians forces support of any type of reaction to that event? Um, cause I was so, so young, I was still a private, I, I didn't have the, um, the ins and outs of everything, but from, from my, um, I, what I could see from myself, there's a lot of security that was going up in our country. So even getting onto our normal bases, everyone was stopped. Uh, mirrors was going under the car. Every car was checked, um, you know, fully, um, I know we're doing everything in our power to support like what we needed to do logistically. Well, we're going to send people over to the United States to help. Um, and we were, I know a lot of our bases were on high alert. Um, I think every, pretty much everyone was called back in off leave. Um, and we were almost ready to go to whatever uh, eventuated after that. It's, a, it's incredibly interesting to hear how that ripple effect uh, really affected the whole world. It, it wasn't just the United States. Um, yeah. So we, we Going back to your deployments, um, I, I had a, a question for you in regards to um, the, the different types of logistics. So when, when you were doing logistical support for in Iraq versus mm-hmm. Afghanistan, did you see a different type? It, it was a different time, obviously. Did you see a different type of uh, equipment or machinery that was coming in at that time to support the efforts on the front line? Or was it, was it similar in nature? Um, I think from a... Uh, like an infantry standpoint, obviously the, um, the equipment was getting better. Um, we're still getting better now, like with our um, level of, um, uh, you know, weapons and body armor and the like, we're, we're just slowly starting to go through that ripple effect now. Um, whereas everyone's starting to get the new equipment at that time frame, um, I think all the soldiers were there. We're getting the best that we had at, at the time when they were deployed overseas. When it comes to, from a logist- logistical standpoint, um, the, the basic level of the equipment that we had was being sent overseas for what we needed. Um, it still felt like we were buying a lot of um, equipment instead of actually using our own. So a lot of our equipment that we train up on to then get deployed overseas and it's, it's stuff that we've felt that it's a lot easier to buy equipment rather than send our own. Um, Cause in the past we've sent a lot of equipment overseas, especially when we went to Banda Arche, a lot of our equipment stayed over there cause it was just too much of an effort to try and bring it back. But that was mainly like tents and the like, but, uh, when it comes to MHE and the like, I think we, we probably buy too much equipment. And um, as long as we do the training on that, it, it's very similar to what we use. But, yeah, it's very, it, it's, it makes it easier and harder in, at the same time. Sure, yeah. So, so I, I did a, a rotation over there in Pacific Pathways. Of, um, I was in rotation 18-2. We were attached to the two of the 14th uh, LHR Light Horse Regiment. Um, oh, yep, I don't yep. know. If, yeah. So those, those guys are, are very unique. Their, their equipment was, was top of the line. I mean, it made our Humvees and, and LMTVs look like, uh, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like Volkswagens, you know, they <laughs> versus, versus the Humvee. So um, it was the, the equipment that I saw was top notch. Um, and I, I could only imagine uh, if we're using that as supporting our front lines overseas, um, the the type of logistical support we have is is uh, has greatly increased. So what 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 kind of uh, what kind of equipment uh, upgrades have you seen over your career uh, that is that has made your guys' job significantly better? Um, I think for what you just said then, Travis. Um, especially when I was in Afghanistan, the PMVs that we had deployed over there. Um, I think every other country. I know the Dutch bought a lot of um, of our PMVs. Um, and I think that's the one thing, because especially when the IEDs were hitting them, it wasn't doing too much damage to the crew inside, whereas our ASLAVs and other armored vehicles we had, um, there wasn't much happening. Um, There's a lot of damage, sorry, doing to those vehicles, where the PMV was probably the upmarket thing at the time, and it's still getting better and better. And it's one of the one thing we do own, I think a lot of countries see, and they say that, you know, they, they like to use those equipment. Um, it's funny when you talk about your Humvees, I know as an Australian soldier, as a young Australian soldier, every time we saw one, we always wanted to drive that. And I think the Australian, the Amer- American soldiers wanted to drive air equipment. It's always funny to see that. <laughs> sure. Um, sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're slowly getting better. Like all, um, all our vehicles we're coming in line with, with yours. Uh, believe it or not, like all of our vehicles um, used to be like all manual with a, you know, with a stick and stuff like that. Well, now everything's become automotive, automatic. Um, all our trucks now are being upgraded. We've got, um, so for the, for the transport guys, we've got um, M40s and HX77s, which are replacing our old uh, Unimog and Mac variants. 
Um, we've got G-Wagons, which are placing the old Land Rovers. Um, uh, we've got some, and, and all the equipment slowly but surely getting there. The hardest thing, as you, you guys both attest to, is the fact that you've got all these soldiers that have been around just as long as I have, that have just lot now, well, I can't operate any of this piece of equipment because I could brought all this new stuff in. And being at the rank that I am, it's hard to try and train the young soldiers when I'm actually behind where they are with regards to the, t- the trade knowledge and the, and the, and the uh, licensing side of things. Yeah, the sure. like a unique challenge, man. It's tough yeah. to keep up. <laughs> so for our listeners, up. when, when uh, Nathan talks about the J-Wagon, the J-Wagon's actually a Mercedes, correct? Yeah, yeah, sorry, J-Wagon, yep. Yep, so, the, so those are, yeah, I mean, it, it, looks like a, it looks like a very modern vehicle, um, <laughs> basically on steroids, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's another, another vehicle that came through that I'm, I'm actually not qualified to drive in at the moment because they wanted to get all their soldiers through first. And my question was, well, how am I supposed to train my soldiers if I haven't got the license myself? But because now my role is sitting behind a desk and, you know, I'm in the operations cell, which I'll talk about shortly. Um, so my role isn't to train them. I'm now now to tell them where they are to go with that piece of equipment. So that's how, obviously, it works out when you get up the other chain of command. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to keep <laughs> up, man. That, that's why, uh, <laughs> is it the same thing in the Australian service? Can you retire at 20 years? Um, it's changed a lot now. Uh, it used to be you do 20 years and then you can uh, retire on a pension. Yep. Um, whereas now um, they've changed over the super, superannuation side of things. Um, it used to be D- DFRDB, which, um, and now it's on MSBS, which that's another story in itself. Uh, um, but the longer you stay in now, they try and say, the longer you stay now, the better official is for you superannuation wise for once you do retire. So, yeah. I got you. Okay. So if, um, if we pick it up, so after you came back from Afghanistan, what what happened with your career from from that point? Um, so that's when um, things started to to um, get more um, busier with regards to the ships um, that we were purchasing. Um, we were feeling that our amphibious um, craft uh, that the Navy had, so HMAS Tobruk was very old. Like I said, was born in nineteen eighties. We had HMAS Menorah and Canimbla, which were actually purchased off the um, United States Navy. Um, I'll have to show you a picture of one. You, as soon as you see a picture of one of these ships, you'll know exactly what it is. Um, if you watch the, mo- the movie Pearl Harbor with Michael Bay, the director, those ships mm-hmm. are in those scenes. Um, so that basically we've bought those ships and I think we just modified them to use for ourselves. So those ships are pretty much obsolete. Um, so we, we purchased um, RFA Largs Bay over in uh, England, uh, which we've now named HMAS Trill. So I had to fly over to England. Um, we, we sailed her back, uh, trained on that, for about, I was on that, I posted to her for about 18 months, did all the training with regards to that. I was a, still a corporal at the time. Um, and towards the end of uh, 2012, I was lucky enough to be um, offered promotion and go to HMAS Canberra. So we um, we're in the process of building two LHDs, so landing heavy docks, um, landing heavy docks, um, so amphibious ships. Uh, so HMAS Canberra was going to be the first one. Um, so the hull pretty much got built in Spain and then the top half got built here in Australia, down in Melbourne. Um, so I commissioned her. Um, we did all the lead up training. I was a sergeant at the time. So I was posted to her for three years and uh, it was definitely a unique experience going from Tobruk to Tools to HMAS Canberra and the capability we have now is second to none. Um, and uh, just the, the, the things we're able to do now um, like Chills was able to, you know, dock down and bring a landing craft in. Um, whereas HMAS Canberra and now HMAS Adelaide does the same thing. Um, when I was lucky enough to come over to the um, to Jacksonville, in North Carolina, to do a course over there, it was referenced a load planning tool that we did with the Marines there. We're lucky enough to go. Um, what's your big, what's your big naval base on the east side? Is that that's in Norfolk. Norfolk, yep. yep. We were lucky enough to go up there and go on some of your um, LHDs as well. I think the boxer was still there. Oh, you might have been at Little Creek then. Uh, uh, okay, yep. That actually sounds very familiar. Yep. yep we're lucky yep. enough. Okay. We're lucky enough to go there and see some of those landing crafts and, you know, just seeing what they do and how different they are between each other um, and the like. So it was, it was a unique experience and uh, definitely going from HMOs to Brook where we did all the crane work to lead all the vehicles on from the wharf onto the ship, whereas our LHDs now pretty much you pretty much don't touch any. There are gantry cranes inside the ship, but pretty much everything is loaded on by the sides of off the wharf. So it makes our life so much easier. Uh, the loading of the ship take is very quick. Um, 
depending on what you're loading, you've got two two main decks, a heavy deck and a light vehicle deck. Um, you can crane equipment up to the flight deck if you need to. Um, but yeah, just that capability now has just grown from an amphibious role, which I'm mainly involved in. And the, yeah, that, that pretty much completes my sea, sea time um, as a sergeant. Okay. Now that's, uh, that's a pretty busy time. So how, how much time did you actually spend in the States? I'm sorry if I missed that. Um, I, was about, I was there for about six weeks. Oh, okay. Okay. So a fair amount of training. And uh, unfortunately, down in Jacksonville, it, that's yeah. <laughs> I, I wouldn't consider that to be the uh, the spot to be on the East Coast. <laughs> a lot of a lot of great Marines. A lot of great work goes on there, but not a lot of yeah. fun things to do. No, I I um I wish now going back. If hindsight's a beautiful thing, there's a lot of things I wish I'd done when I was there. When we had the opportunity, when we had a bit of free time, but you know, I'd love to still get uh, get back over there eventually. Yeah, I hear you. So, um, okay. So you finished up that tour and came out as sergeant and then what you came back to back to Sydney or down to Brisbane? Um, so once I finished, um, my time at HMAS Canberra, I wanted to be closer to, um, unfortunately my dad passed away in 2010 and, um, I wanted to be posted to Brisbane, which is not far away from where my, my mum, my mother is. Um, she lives in Harvey Bay, which is about, about three hours drive. So I just wanted to be close to her just so I could be there for support if needed to. So I went into an instructional position. Um, so basically a, a corporal promotion course. And I was posted in that role for about four years, uh, three years as an instructor. And last year I uh, did most of my year as an operations warrant officer. So um, which helped me into the role I'm doing now, which is now as, as a warrant officer in the operation, operation cell um, right now. Okay. So, um, I guess it's, it sounds like it's similar. So, uh, a warrant officer is a pretty big deal. Uh, <laughs> I think anyway, so you, um, is, is it that, that same thing where you can go up the enlisted spectrum to a certain level? Uh, but before you get too high, you can, you can apply, uh, to, to be a warrant officer because you're a specialist in that specific trade. Is that how it works? Um, a little bit different. Um, so when you get to a certain rank, um, you normally get asked, would you like to go regimental or would you like to go trade orientated? Um, mm -hmm. you can still, you can still get to, to the rank of warrant officer, uh, class two, um, which is equivalent to an e EO8. Um, you can still get that, but still stay in your job. Uh, or if you want to go regimental, you can go down that stream, but you can, then you can uh, be the role of an, um, a squadron sergeant major or a company sergeant major, um, and, and still go down that, but rank rank's still the same. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. So, all right. So in the States, yeah, the warrant officer, it's, it's, um, it's like the, there's three levels, right? There's enlisted warrant and officer yep. and, um, a warrant officer is pretty much treated like a commissioned officer in the okay. U S. Okay. So it, it sounds like a warrant officer in Australia would be more like a, a senior non-commissioned officer in the army or Navy in the U S I think that's, that's what I'm yeah. hearing. Yeah. We're, we're still classified as a senior NCA. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So you, is how far up can you go? What's, what's the top level for the enlisted ranks? Um, so if above me is a warrant officer class one. Um, and then you okay. have different tiers. Uh, so okay. if you go up basic uh, warrant officer class one is in your trade, but if you're going down the regimental stream, that's a different tier above. If you want to become an, a, re, a regimental sergeant major, mm -hmm. and then you've got warrant off, then you've got warrant officer of the army, which is obviously the highest you can get. And then uh, depending on that, if you want to, if you want to commission, Oh, I see. Okay. Is there an, an age limit before? You, so if you, if you don't get to a certain point by a certain age, can you still go for a commission? Uh, I, I don't think there's, there is an age limit as long as you're, you're not near, near your retirement age. Um, okay, I think okay. it, as long as you fit the qualifications and, and the like. So right now, if I was to change, if I wanted to commission now, I'd probably change over to the rank of captain. Um, okay. if you're, if you're a sergeant and below, uh, depending on how much experience you've got and how much time and rank you have, you could be changed over as a lieutenant or as a captain, just depending on what role and position that you are changing over to. I got you. Okay. Now that makes sense. No, I, I appreciate the, the lesson. Uh, Cause <laughs> a lot of times when I tried, like when I was in uh, South Korea, you know, you, you always try to find your, your counterpart of the same rank and then exchange color devices. And um, yeah. <laughs> they were spot on the same, both uh, their army and, and, you know, chief was a chief or first class or first class. So it was easy to figure out, but uh, yeah, I wasn't sure how it worked in Australia. It's very, very uh, funny. Um, so Travis will probably attest to this as well. Like uh, us in the U S army. So our corporal rank is, I think it's the same EO number as a, as a sergeant. So it's very, 
very strange how we do it that way. I've never under, it's always intrigued me how 